the journey of any distance or any speed always starts with a single step, right? Yes. And my first step into the wilderness took place when I was 21 years old. I had just graduated from college, but I felt like something was missing from my education. I didn't know anything about the wilderness, and I felt like I only knew a little bit about myself. So I decided that before I started my real job, I would take some time, I would take four to six months and hike the Appalachian Trail. Now it would have helped if I had backpacking experience. <laughs> I did not. In fact, I had only spent two nights in the woods my entire life. But the good news is, at age 21, that doesn't matter, <laughs> right? Because I thought, I knew everything, I thought I could do anything, and so a few months after graduation, I started in Georgia by myself with my brother's old Boy Scout gear and the goal of walking all the way to Maine. And after five of the hardest months I have ever known, I made it to Katahdin. I made it to the last mountain. But when I got there, I was a completely different person. And I liked the woman at the end a whole lot more than the girl who had started. And I want to take a minute and share some of my transformation with you. And I want to do it by reading a passage from my first book. And my first book is called Becoming Odessa. And that probably sounds like a strange title to most of you. But just so you know, Odessa is actually my trail name. And it's really common when you go and you hike a long distance trail that you take a nickname while you're out there. And I'm willing to bet we have a few trail names in here. Do I see any hands? So there are a couple. There are a couple. And the folks who raise their hands, I'm sure they would attest to the fact that hikers love to give other hikers their trail names. <laughs> and my first week on the Appalachian Trail, if you can't tell, by the way, I'm six feet tall, and I've been six feet tall since eighth grade. <laughs> so I immediately got suggestions like Sasquatch <laughs> and Amazon and Stretch. And I also quickly decided that I didn't want to be called any of those names for another six months of my life. But then I was being a big dork and comparing the trail to Homer's Odyssey. And another hiker said, hey, what about the trail name Odysseus? And I really liked that. But I was proud to be a woman out there and kind of wanted a feminine trail name. So we changed Odysseus to Odessa, and I've been Odessa on every hike since. So here's a passage from the last full day of Odessa's first journey. When people had asked why I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail, one of the answers I had given was that I wanted time to think about where I wanted to live and what I wanted to do for a living. And the trail would give me plenty of time to do that. But now that I was at the end, I didn't feel any closer to knowing those answers than when I started. The only thing I felt more certain of at the end of this journey was myself. I was no longer defined by my resume, and I didn't give answers based on what I thought other people wanted to hear. For the first time in my life, I knew who I was, and I was okay with who I was. At the end of this journey, I definitely believed in God. And for the first time in my life, I didn't feel like I needed to hide that. My affection for other hikers and their acceptance of me helped me realize that regardless of faith and background, if you get to know people, not what they are, but who they are, 
then you will experience friendships you might otherwise have missed. I also now knew that something deep within me connected with nature and with hard work and with simplicity. And I learned that I was both stubborn and tough, a lot tougher than I thought I was, especially when I let other people help me. Thanks. I'll take it. Now, when it was all said and done, I got off trail and I got a job. I mean, much to my mother's relief, <laughs> I got a job. And it was a pretty good job, and I was working with fun people, and I think everything said that I should have been happy. I should have been content. But the weeks started to pass, and then the months started to pass, and all I could think about was the trail. I couldn't shake it. And I missed it. I mean, I missed moving through nature. My job was great, but it was still a desk job. So I sat there most of the day. And while I sat there, quite often I, I missed my friends, the friends I had made on the trail. It was the first environment I had been a part of where the people who were the closest to me were extremely different from me. And that made life really fun and really interesting. Hmm. But surprisingly, and I'm going to say surprisingly, because when I started my journey, I started by myself, and I was terrified that I was going to be bored and lonely. But when I finished the trail, I longed for the silence and the solitude I had discovered as much as I long for my friends. But the thing I missed most of all, it sounds really weird and it's a little hard to explain, because the thing I missed most about hiking the Appalachian Trail was how beautiful I felt in the wilderness. And that absolutely, positively does not make sense. Because when I was out on the trail, I was filthy. <laughs> Filthy. And we won't even talk about the smell because you can't put it into words. <laughs> it is horrible. And I had scrapes and bug bites and bruises covering my body. But for five months, I didn't have a mirror. And I didn't have billboards or magazines or commercials telling me what I should look like. So I started to see myself in a whole new way. I saw myself through interactions with other hikers. So if I made someone else smile, that made me feel pretty. And growing up, I had always thought that nature was beautiful. And hopefully we can all agree that nature is beautiful. Amen. But I had never seen myself as a part of nature and a part of that beauty until I walked the trail. And after hiking all the way from Georgia to Maine, you better believe I based my self-worth a whole lot less on how I looked and a whole lot more on what I could do. And maybe that was the biggest gift the trail gave me. It made me realize I could do so much more than I once thought was possible, both on and off the trail. And around that time, I started saving up time away from work, started saving up money from work, and I started to plan my next big hike. And for several years, I fell into this routine of working and hiking and working and hiking. And one of the great things about being a hiker is that there are trails everywhere. I mean, here we are in Michigan. I know you guys have at least two national scenic trails. You have the Superior Trail and you have the North Country Trail. I'm sure there's more. You don't have to look far. I mean, there are paths all over the US, all over the world. And in my opinion, 
hiking is the most affordable, the most accessible, and the best way to travel. <laughs> and I'm going to take a minute and try to convince you, if you don't believe me, and I'll share some of my favorite hiking pictures from all over the world. So i got to step back here. Hold on. And as the pictures run through, I'll try to tell you where they were taken. So we'll start the slideshow in Africa at Mount Kilimanjaro. All right, we go very quickly to Australia. This is on the 600 mile Bibbulmun track. <laughs> now we're in Peru, so we're in South America. And that hurt, by the way. <laughs> The next few pictures were all taken on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Okay, and now we go to the Pacific Crest Trail. So these photos are from California, Oregon, and Washington. And all the rest of the pictures will come from different parts of Europe. So do you guys like those pictures? Yes. So hopefully you all can see that the trail was taking me to some pretty incredible places. And by the time I was 25, I admitted I had a problem. <laughs> and it's really funny. One time I said this in a talk, and someone in the audience yelled back, and 12 steps just wasn't enough. <laughs> and it was true, I was a hiker. I mean, all my time, all my money was going to the trail. So at that point, I actually quit my day job to start my own hiking company. Because I wanted to help other people get outdoors, and I thought I could do that through writing and speaking and also guiding on the trail. But I still wanted to hike some on my own, too. And I was starting to plan for my next trip when all of a sudden something happened that I thought might ruin everything. I heard it. He got it right there. I, I didn't see you get slapped, so that was good. But sure enough, I, I fell in love. I got engaged. 
And I was convinced that at the time in my life when I was ready to be married, I would need to be ready to settle down, or at least just slow down. But I was really lucky to meet this great guy who loves me for me, which is the crazy hiker. And he is really supportive, but maybe most important of all, I ended up marrying a fellow who is a public school teacher. Summer's off. Summer's off. That's right. This could work, right? And that, uh, that was going to actually work out perfectly because I told Brew, that's my husband who y'all will meet later, I told Brew on our very first date that I wanted to hike the entire Appalachian Trail again. And as much as he loved me, <laughs> even after we were engaged, he still did not want to hike 2,185 miles with me. <laughs> so we started talking about how I could still hike, but how we could also spend time together. And we came up with the idea of doing a supported hike. And a supported hike takes a really long trail, like the AT, and it basically turns it into a series of day hikes. So now instead of carrying my big heavy pack with tent and sleeping bag and several days worth of food, all I had to carry was a day pack with just the items I needed to reach the next road crossing. Because at every road crossing, there would be my husband, and what else would be there? Food, gear, supplies. So I could get whatever I wanted, but just what I needed to reach the following road crossing. So as soon as we decided that we were going to complete the trail in that manner, I decided that I wanted to try and establish a women's record on the Appalachian Trail. Because as long as I had heard about supported hikes, not all of them, but a number of them had been in regards to records. People trying to go very quickly down the trail. But every record I had ever heard of on the AT belonged to a man. And I am all about some girl power. <laughs> so I thought there should be a women's record too. And because there wasn't one, I figured if we were smart and if I stayed healthy, we would probably accomplish our goal. So on June 8th, 2008, Brew and I got married. <laughs> and then just 12 days later, we started the trail. <laughs> and if you ever really want to work on communication <laughs> and teamwork and trust, then I highly recommend a long distance hiking trail. But after 57 days of working together and being a team, we made it to the end and we had accomplished our goal. I established a women's record and along the way I had averaged 38 miles a day. And that's not too shabby, right? <laughs> That had been challenging and difficult, but I was surprised. I was surprised at how much I loved it. <laughs> and looking back, I should have loved it. I mean, that summer, there I was, a newlywed, on my favorite trail, doing exactly what I loved all day, every day. And the man who I love more than anyone was running all of my errands. All of them. <laughs> Every single one. But here's the thing. When we got to the end, Brew and I walked up the last mountain together. And on the summit, there's a rock with a plaque that represents the end. So we went up to it, and we both put our hands on it. And as soon as we did, I turned to my husband just grinning from ear to ear. And then he turned to me and he said, we are never doing that again. <laughs> and he meant it. Um, <laughs> but there was just one small problem. We hiked off that mountain, back down to our car to go home. 
And as we walked down, I knew I could have kept going. I could have kept going. I still had something left. And I didn't know how much, but now I knew that when you were trying to set a record on the Appalachian Trail, it actually has very little to do with speed or strength or even gender. What do you think it's all about? You guys tell me, what do you think it's all about? Perseverance. Perseverance? Desire. The love of the Desire, trail. love. Stamina. Stamina. Determination. Training, sure. All those things go into a record attempt. So does having an amazing support team, a reliable vehicle. I mean, good weather goes a long way on a record <laughs> attempt, right? So there were a lot of factors, but thinking through those factors, now there was this small voice inside of me that said, I might. I might have what it would take to set the overall record. But I took that voice, and out of respect for my husband, I buried it down deep. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would just go away. And so the next few summers, Brew and I agreed to hike much shorter trails. He even got to pick the trails. <laughs> So we went out to Colorado and we did the 500 mile Colorado trail from Denver to Durango. And it was awesome. And then to top that, the next summer we went over to Europe and hiked on different long distance trails in Europe. And it was incredible. But what do you think happened to that small voice? <laughs> did it go away? Yeah, it got louder, it grew stronger, and it got to the point where I knew there were only two options. Either we would go back and try, at least just try for the overall record, or else I would always look back, and I would always wonder what might have been. And I didn't want to do that. I don't think anyone wants to do that. So I sat down with Brew and we had a long conversation. But by the end, he had agreed to help me one, just one more time. And in 2011, we went back to the AT. And we decided that we wanted to start in Maine, not down in Georgia. Why do you think we wanted to do that? OK, yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of right answers, but because it's downhill is not one of them. Um, <laughs> you know, part of it was weather, crowds, wanting to hike home was a big part of it. But the, the main reason I wanted to start up in Maine was that I wanted to get through the hardest part of the trail in the beginning. And Maine and New Hampshire are the toughest, most technical states on the entire AT. And I also wanted to hike through that portion of trail with the longest daylight hours of the year. So we started up in Maine in mid-June, and for the first few days, everything went about how we thought they would. Until day five. And on day five, I was going up a steep mountain in Maine, and on my way to the summit, I started to notice a a sharp pain developing between my knee and my ankle on my right leg. And by the time I got to the ridge line, I was in so much pain that I just limped down the trail until the exact same pain that was in my right leg developed in my left leg. And within three hours, I had full-blown shin splints. Funny, I can always tell who's had shin splints because I'll say the word and folks will grimace like it's the worst thing ever. Because it's the worst thing ever, exactly. <laughs> uh, and if you've had shin splints, then you know that, you know, hiking uphill is excruciating, but going downhill is unbearable. Backwards, exactly. There were times on my descent when I was going, you know, frontwards that I would plant my foot 
and my leg would just buckle beneath me because of the pain. So multiple times I collapsed down to the trail. But I was pretty convinced that my shin splints had been caused by the high mileage days on the rocks up in Maine. I actually trained for a full year leading up to the record attempt. But I trained almost entirely down south, mm -hmm. where we have a lot of nice dirt trails. And up in Maine and New Hampshire, <laughs> well, there's a lot of exposed, unforgiving <laughs> granite. But if I could just get to Vermont. <laughs> Has anyone in here hiked in Vermont? A few people? A lot of hikers on the trail actually like to call Vermont Vermud. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's the one state where you take a step and you lift your foot and your shoe is no longer attached to it. It is shoe sucking mud, especially in the first half of the summer. So it's sloppy and it's messy, but it's also soft enough to where I thought my legs might be able to heal. So that was my goal, make it to Vermont. And all I had to do was hike through New Hampshire to get there. <laughs> Small detail, right? Um, and actually even getting into New Hampshire was, was difficult because from the time I got my shin splints to Pinkham Notch in New Hampshire, Every time I got to the top of a mountain, I was in so much discomfort that I was forced to turn around and then hike or scramble downhill backwards. Yeah. And no one once stopped and asked, hey, are you that girl who's trying to set the record? No, 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 no. But at one point, I straight up got asked if I was lost or confused, okay? <laughs> But by hiking backwards, at least I was able to keep moving forward. And I made it to New Hampshire. And if there's one state on the entire trail where I wake up in the morning and I pray for good weather, it's New Hampshire. And when I got there, I had about 24 hours of decent weather. And then I started going up the slopes of Mount Washington. And Mount Washington, it's not only one of the, the tallest peaks on the trail, but at one point, Mount Washington actually had the highest recorded wind speed of any place on the planet. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, as soon as I got above tree line, that wind picked up. I mean, the type of wind that can knock you over. The wind picked up, and then the clouds rolled in, and then the rain started to fall. Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> you see, for the next 36 hours, I was hiking through a torrential downpour. And it was miserable. But I kept telling myself, it's got to change. I mean, it can't stay like this forever. It has got to change. The only problem was, it changed when I got up to Franconia Ridgeline, and there the last week of June, I was no longer in a rainstorm because now I was in the middle of a sleet storm. I mean, you could say wintery mix. There was some snow in there too, but sleet and snow. And the worst part was, I thought I was prepared. I mean, I know hiking up there any time of the year, you go prepared for bad weather. So I had great gear. I had extra snacks. They were all frozen, but I had extra snacks, and none of it seemed to matter. See, I had put a great demand on my body for almost 10 days at that point, and I had been hiking through a cold, steady rain for a day and a half. So my good gear and my extra food didn't seem to matter, because I was soaking wet and I was shivering, and I felt like I was starving, and now I was in the middle of a sleet storm. And I wanted to do anything to take my mind off those conditions. So I started to sing out loud. 
And there are actually a lot of hikers you can catch singing out loud. But it's especially fun for me because I have a horrible voice. <laughs> <laughs> but on a, on a 6,000 foot ridge line and a sleet storm, you can sing as loud as you want. No one cares. So I started belting out my favorite song that summer, but from the very beginning, I was just slurring the song. I was mumbling all the words. And oh yeah, I was tripping like every five or six steps. So finally, I acknowledged what deep down I already knew. And what was that? Yeah, I was moderately hypothermic, and it was getting a lot worse very quickly. And dealing with hypothermia, well, in your mind, as long as you're thinking clearly, and that starts to go too, but as long as you're thinking clearly, you know you have to get someplace warm and dry. But all your body wants to do and physiologically, all your body starts to do is just shut down. So all I wanted to do was curl up into a tight ball and stay there and shiver. But I only let myself pause once, and that was to see if there was anything else in my pack that I could put on. And I had a trash bag, so I poked a hole for my head and two for my arms and added it to my layers. And then I brought out my spare set of socks. What do you think I did with my socks? You can tell we're in Michigan. I asked that in the South. No one knows what I did with my socks. But yes, I made them into mittens. And I kept marching. But by the time I made it to the base of the mountain, I was so cold and I was so stiff that I could barely bend my joints. Now, Brew, he knew there was bad weather up on the ridge. So he had hiked in from the road, he set up our tent, and as soon as I saw it, I got inside. But I was so rigid, I was so out of sorts, I couldn't even undress myself. He had to help me out of cold, wet clothes and into two sleeping bags, and for the next 30 minutes, I laid there and I just shivered, because that was all I could do. But when I finally started to relax just a little bit, what do you think I wanted to do next? Eat. Good. I heard it over here. Eat. Food. Food is wonderful medicine for hypothermia. And I was voracious. And in the next 20 minutes, I consumed over 3,000 calories. <laughs> and I know that for a fact because my husband took some type of sick pleasure in counting the wrappers <laughs> that I was throwing to the wayside. So at the end of 20 minutes, I no doubt had a sugar rush. And all of a sudden, I had this rush of adrenaline from surviving something I thought might be life-threatening up on the ridge. So now I had all this energy. And now what do you think I wanted to do? Back. Get back on the trail, right? And Brew thought of everything. He brought the tent, he brought the food, he even remembered extra clothes. So I put on a warm fleece and a dry rain jacket, but as I was getting dressed, I realized there was not an extra set of shorts or pants inside the tent. So I turned to the corner of the shelter where my cold, wet, icy shorts sat in the middle of a puddle. Ugh. And then I turned to my husband. <laughs> and I glanced back at the puddle, and I glanced back at my husband, and I said, oh, I want your shorts. And I just thought it was a really good idea, you know, like creative problem solving. And this is, this is so brew. This is so my husband, because he did not bat an eye. He did not disagree. He was in the midst of taking off his shorts when he looked at me, and he did have one short reply. He said, at least ask nicely. <laughs> at least ask nicely. So I did. And I got his shorts, and I was, I was able to keep hiking. And uh, 
As a side note, it was the last week of June and he was wearing the Grinch that stole Christmas boxers. <laughs> so he had to pack up everything and hike back to the car in his boxers. And there are so many reasons I love to tell that story. Um, one reason is no doubt to point out his underwear. But number two, that story, uh, along with dozens and dozens more, it so clearly demonstrates that it was Bruce's support. It was my husband's support that always allowed me to keep going. And it wasn't just Brew. I mean, we had friends and family members and hikers and runners who came out to help for a few hours or a few days, but Brew was the only one who was with me from the beginning all the way to the end. And when I think about our record, I believe it has more to do with Brew than anyone else, more to do with his logistical, emotional, physical support than it does with my athleticism. And I know I would have quit without him. You see, when we finally got to Vermont, <laughs> when we finally got to that one state where everything was supposed to get better, everything had to get better, that was the worst day <laughs> of the entire summer. Still had the shin splints. Now I had these weird after effects from the hypothermia. And on top of that, I got sick, really sick. And that's never fun. I mean, that's not fun at home, but that's especially not fun on the trail. And the type of sick I had, I wasn't even on the trail. I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I was running <laughs> off trail every few minutes. So I was depleted and I was dehydrated and I couldn't even hike one mile per hour. So for the first time on any trail, I quit. I didn't think I could keep going. I did not want to keep going. I just told myself I'd get to the next road crossing and when I arrived, we were headed home. And when I finally made it there, Brew was waiting for me, like always. And so I told him how sick I was. I told him how much I hurt. And I told him that we were, we were finished with the trail. And that was a decision. That was not a discussion. And never in a million years did I think he would disagree with me. <laughs> I mean, seriously, though, this was my dream, not his. And it was almost as hard on him as it was on me, and he made it very clear before the summer that he would rather just have a normal vacation like a normal family and go to the beach. <laughs> but here he was out here helping me, and I had never been in so much agony. And I was convinced that his response would be to wrap me up in his arms and help me to the car and get me to some place where I could start to feel better. So I looked at him with tears streaming down my face, waiting for my hug, for my embrace. <laughs> and Brew looked straight back at me and he said, suck it up. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And um, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, Every time I tell this story, I get a little angry. Because <laughs> I remember how much I hurt, and I remember how upset I was, and I get a little angry. But when it actually happened, I was just shocked. <laughs> I mean, I was. I was so surprised that for a minute, Brew kept talking, and I didn't listen to a word he said, because in my mind, all I could think was, I have created a monster. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this is not the guy I married. But when I finally tuned in, here was Bruce's supporting argument. He said, if you really want to quit, if that's truly what you want, that's fine. But you just can't quit right now. He said, right now, I think you feel too bad to make a good decision. 
So you have to eat and drink and take medicine and then keep going. And tomorrow night, if you still want to quit, I'll take you home. So I left that row crossing counting the minutes and the miles until I could officially stop. But after the 12 hardest miles that I have ever walked, I started to feel a little bit better. And when I felt just a little bit better, I still felt really, really bad, okay? <laughs> Let's be clear, I still felt really bad. And I thought that the record was completely out of reach. When I started that summer, I knew I had to average over 46 miles a day to break the record. There I was on day 12, averaging 38 miles a day. And now, you know, I felt a little bit better, but I was still barely going two miles per hour. So no part of me thought that I could set the record. But I was reminded at that point, I was reminded that my ultimate goal that summer was to not necessarily set the overall record. My ultimate goal was to find my best on the trail to try and discover my limits, or to see what it felt like for <coughs> once in my life to really give 100% to something. And I was close, <laughs> but I wasn't there yet. And I decided that I wanted to keep going, and I wanted to just see what would happen. And it was amazing, because that marked a real shift in our journey, where we stopped worrying about miles per hour and numbers and the previous record holder and we started to just focus on doing our best. And I learned so many things that summer, but one of the main things I learned is that, A, it's amazing what can happen when you're just willing to see what can happen. And B, it's amazing what can happen when you stop worrying about what other people have done, and you start focusing on doing your best. Because after 46 days, 11 hours, and 20 minutes of doing our best, we made it to Springer Mountain, Georgia. We accomplished what almost everyone thought was impossible, and at times what I believed was impossible. We set the overall record for men and women and along the way, I averaged 46.93 miles a day. So every single day after the moment when I quit, I averaged over 50 miles a day. But I didn't do it like the record setters of the past. I didn't run that summer. Instead, I started hiking every morning at 5 a.m. And I kept hiking for 16 or 17 hours straight. So I was lucky to get six hours of sleep at night. And I was trying to consume over 6,000 calories a day. Oh, and then 46 days, I saw 36 black bears. Whoa. But when I got to the end, and I want to point out, I want to point out, we finished, we finished on Springer Mountain which is the exact same mountain I started on as a 21-year-old right out of college. We finished on that mountain, and I knew in that moment that the value of the trail could never be put into numbers, not even on a record. Because the value of the trail will always be found in the experience, the lessons learned and the memories made and the relationships formed. I mean, you go outdoors to go outdoors. And I think, it sounds weird, but one of the things I like most about the AT record is that it is truly an amateur pursuit. I mean, you do it for the love of it, it's based on the honor system, and when you get to the end, I promise you, there's no trophy, okay? <laughs> there's no big cardboard check, there's not even a free t-shirt, there's nothing there. <laughs> But that doesn't mean there isn't a reward. And I, I mean, I 
firmly believe that every time you go outdoors, it doesn't matter if it's a day hike or a weekend or a section or a through hike or a record attempt, every time you go outdoors, there's a reward. Amen. And to wrap up tonight, I'll um, share a little of my reward with you that summer. And I'll read one final passage coming from my new book called Again. There we stood on top of Springer Mountain. We had beaten the previous record by 26 hours. I couldn't decide if 26 hours seemed like a fleeting moment or an eternity. I guess in the end it didn't matter. I had done my absolute best and this summer I could walk off this mountain never wondering what might have been. Looking out at the crowd that had gathered, our friends and family members who hiked up Springer Mountain to greet us, it almost felt as if Brew and I were back at our wedding weekend. The people who meant the most to us were all there. There were pictures being taken and hugs being exchanged. This scene caused me to reminisce about our actual wedding ceremony. But coming to and looking out at the view on top of Springer Mountain, I think I preferred this occasion even more. Up here, Brew and I did not exchange traditional vows. Instead, we professed our commitment through the actions of the past 46 days. The trail brought to life a passage which had been read at our wedding. It says, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I had never felt more in love with my husband or with the wilderness than I did on top of Springer Mountain. I did not want to leave. And this summer, I honestly did not think I could hike down the mountain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we like to um, conclude with one final slideshow that has pictures from the Appalachian Trail and our record attempt. But before we do that, I want to take just a few minutes to see if any of you all have questions. And also, hopefully, um, depending on our 20-month-old daughter, hopefully around this time, um, my husband and our daughter will wander in, and you're welcome to ask Brew questions as well. Yeah? So knowing how poorly the start of your trip was, do you ever ask yourself, what if I'd been 100%? So the question was, knowing how hard the start of the record was, do I think I could do it better in the future? Uh, no. <laughs> I think you have to expect every day on the record to be the hardest day of your life, and especially those first two weeks, because that's really when you're asking your body to adapt um, to the demand. So I think that two-week window is really crucial on a long-distance record, and it's not if you're going to get hurt, if you're going to get sick, it's more when you're going to get hurt and sick. So um, I was thankful that we were able to work through it, that Brew convinced me to keep going because after that it did become less of a physical battle, which sounds strange because it was so physically intense, but at some point it really shifted to be a, a mental challenge and my body adapted to the miles. You said you wore a day pack as opposed to normally when you threw hike it's a 60 pound pack or something like that? Yeah, not quite 60 pounds, but a, a much bigger pack when I am traditionally hiking or backpacking on the trail. Okay, yeah. so, so it's never uh, appropriate for a man to ask a woman what her weight is, so I'll phrase it <laughs> otherwise. It's, what percentage of your pack is, is was your compared to your body weight? Oh, I don't mind weight questions. I, I usually hover in the low 140s, if anyone wants to know. Um, and my pack, usually on a traditional backpacking trip, 
Um, without food and water, it will be around 20 pounds without food and water. It depends on the trail, it depends on the terrain. Um, you know, I can start with 20, 20 pounds and go to the desert and have to carry 16 pounds of water. Um, but that's a, a basic range. On the record, I could, depending on the road crossings, I could carry a water snack and first aid, or sometimes I did have to carry a, a small overnight pack when I couldn't make it to the road and meet brew. So anywhere from three to 15 pounds on the record is what I would have to carry. This is brew, you wanna say hi? Hi. Hi. Um, this is Carly. Do you want to say hello? Hello. Yeah, there you go. That was not rehearsed. That was good. Good job. Um, other questions? Yes? Yeah? Um, some of them are very close. I mean, for example, rounding a turn, you don't have much time to adapt, and the bear could be right there. Um, in those instances, the bear always ran away very quickly. Um, some other times I would see bears off to the side and they would in, maybe be in berry patches and really didn't mind that I was there and, and hiking down the trail. Never had a bad encounter with a bear. Never had a bad encounter with a bear or a snake, which I was terrified of those animals when I started hiking. But the two animals I've had the most trouble with on the trail have actually been insects, um, you know, ticks, bees, mosquitoes, and dogs off leash. So unfriendly dogs off leash. So it's funny because you know my perceived fear has not at all been my um, real experience when it comes to animals on the trail. Um, when you were on the trail, did you try to stay in those wooden structures that are like lean-tos, or did you just sleep out in the open? Uh, my first through hike, I stayed in the shelters quite a bit. Um, they do have these three-sided wooden buildings every seven or eight miles on the trail that you can camp in if you like. Doing the record, I was stopping every night in the dark and starting every morning in the dark. And that's really disruptive to other individuals or hikers at a shelter. So I just made a conscious choice not, not to stay at a shelter um, for that reason. But I did camp at the road crossing with Brew most nights. Sometimes I had to camp on the trail. And I think there were five or six glorious nights where we were close enough and we could spend the night at a motel you know, for like six hours, you know. <laughs> but I got a shower and um, the showers after 350 miles just felt amazing and could keep going the next day. Do you have a favorite part of the trail? I've had a different favorite section every single hike. Um, some stand out each time. One would be Grayson Highland State Park in Southwest Virginia is Amazing, it's got beautiful views, it's got wild ponies. This time of year, there's a lot of blueberries, so that's one of my favorite spots. Katahdin, the northernmost mountain on the trail. I mean, there's something very spiritual about that mountain. The Native Americans called it the mighty mountain. There's something very, um, I think, reverential climbing up that peak. So that's an amazing place, and several others stand out, but I could stand here all night and list them and I won't. So. <laughs> Done much in Grand Canyon. Only a little bit, but um, hopefully we'll go back. Our hiking looks a lot different now that we have Charlie. Um, we still do some overnights, but mostly we're day hikers and our goal is to um, hike in all 50 states with Charlie. And we've done 44, so we're on our way. And then Brew and I are trying to give each other a week to two each year to pursue section hikes on longer trails. So he's working on the AT, and I get 12 days in August on the Continental Divide Trail. So I'll be out in northern Colorado. Did he ever tell you to suck it up again? <laughs> <laughs> if he had told me that during labor, I would have <laughs> hit him. I'm just saying, like, I would have, I would have hit him. No, I don't think, I mean, that was so outside of Bruce's nature. Like, he's the nice one, you know, like, <laughs> seriously, he's, he's sympathetic and empathetic, and that was so outside of nature. So I don't think he's said it before or after, but that was the one moment. I would also say she doesn't usually need to be told it. That's true. Yeah. Her, her publisher um, likes to say Jen is the nicest person that he knows that takes no prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good description. She's, she, she's pretty motivated. In good ways. In good ways, yeah. I have a question for Brew. I love 
she asked what was my experience with hiking before I met Jen. Um, I loved hiking. I did, had never through hiked. Um, oh, well, I thought I loved hiking. I mean, she <laughs> loves hiking, you know. But um, but I had done a lot of hiking uh, out west, like in national parks. I would take road trips and go on overnight hikes, and you know, two three days. I I had been on the Appalachian Trail a couple of times, but never done more than like a twenty mile stretch. So um, I distinctly remember the first date that Jen and I ever had. We went to Mount Mitchell, which is the tallest mountain east of the Mississippi and is only about 45 minutes from Asheville. And we climbed up it and I just remember when we got back down after an 11 mile hike, I just thought, what am I doing myself? <laughs> so much, you know, more than I ever bargained for when I used to hope and pray that I would meet an outdoorsy girl. You know? <laughs> I taught until last June. I taught for seven years, um, five years in middle school. I taught language arts and social studies. The last two I taught um, history. And um, if you, I don't know if you care about that sort of thing in Michigan, but um, in North Carolina, they, if I were still teaching today, I'd be making the same salary that I made my first year eight years ago. They had just frozen teacher pay. And so we thought, well, we might as well give it a shot and go on a book tour and see what happens. And, and uh, it's gone well enough that we want to continue it. So, yeah. How do you, comp how do you compare hiking in the States with other parts of the world? How do I compare hiking in the States with other parts of the world? Um, it, it's wild. Uh, there's a big difference hiking in the United States versus Europe. Uh, Europe doesn't have the same wilderness feel. Um, that we have in the, the United States. Mm -hmm. Also, having Charlie has been awesome because we felt like, okay, well, let's make the most of our trails domestically, and we've hiked all throughout the U.S., and it's amazing how much diversity we have in our country. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. just, you could spend a lifetime in the U.S. and never get to all the amazing trails and places to hike. It's, we have so many resources. So um, it's very different all over the world. I do love seeing other trails.